Tips from the ER, baby boo-boos. It's a joyous moment when your baby starts walking. You've been waiting for this day since you saw little Becky come out between those legs. And now look at her go, touching, licking, tasting everything she can get her miniature little hands on. But a walking baby also means they're a thousand times more likely to hurt themselves. Whether they split their chin open on a coffee table, break an arm jumping off the couch, or slice their face in two running into the TV stand. You gotta watch them like a hawk, motherfuckers. If not, you're gonna end up in the ER holding that screaming baby down while we try to close up whatever open cut is currently occupying your mini-me's cute little face. And when I say hold, I mean really hold. It may take two to three of us to keep him still, but we gotta make sure your baby doesn't move an inch or we're not going anywhere near that injury. If this seems cruel and makes you uncomfortable, you're more than welcome to wait outside because the last resort would be to tranquilize him with a special medication called ketamine, AKA horse tranquilizer. If it'll work on a horse, It'll work on a baby. Tips from the ER. Abscess. An abscess is like a giant pimple growing somewhere on your body. It's a painful swollen lump filled with pus because it's infected. And unlike this giant zit on my face, motherfuckers, if you come into the ER with an abscess, we're gonna slice that baby open and spill all its gooey goodness. First thing we're gonna do, wipe you down, get you some numbing medication, and then we're gonna cut, cut, cut right down the middle. We'll be sure to be properly geared up because if this is your first time, we won't know if you're a squirter. Once open, we're gonna use whatever we have on hand, tools, gauze, fingers, roll it around inside of you to pull out every last drop of juice. Once empty, we're gonna stuff your new body hole full of gauze and let it marinate for a couple days. After one to two days, we pull out all that delicious cotton filled with blood, meat, and pus, patch you up, and send you on your way. Worst place I've ever seen an abscess? Right between a man's ball sack and his booty hole. Safe to say he got all the numbing medication the ER had to offer. Tips from the ER. Jaw dislocation. There are two very specific holes your jaw bone needs to be in at all times for it to work properly. Reasons they may fall out include getting hit in the face or opening your big fat mouth wider than it should. You could have been yawning, laughing, yelling, eating. Maybe you got a little too cavalier at in and out picked up a 4x4, tried to fit it all in one bite, and pop! There goes the mandible. You'll know something's wrong, motherfuckers, because you won't be able to close your mouth. If you come into the ER with a dislocated jaw, we're gonna manually shove it back into your skull by sticking our two giant sausage thumbs into your mouth, pushing down on your molars until we feel a click. We may or may not get you some medications to keep you from squirming around, but once back in, your top and bottom teeth will finally be able to touch each other again, which, let's be honest, is more action than you've gotten all year. Tips from the ER. Your scalp is bleeding. If you've ever bonked your head and cut it open, you'll know that it bleeds a lot. Your head is one of the most vascular parts of your body, which means there's a shit ton of blood that pumps up there. It needs a whole lot of blood because your brain is one of the hardest working organs you have. At least for some of us. Even the tiniest cut can produce a massive amount of blood. It can be pretty scary if you're not used to seeing it, but the most important thing to remember is to stay calm, motherfuckers. Don't panic, it's gonna be okay. You're allowed to lose some blood. You're allowed to lose a lot of blood before you start to die. Apply some pressure and try to keep as much of that blood in your head as possible. Depending on how big that cut is, or if you won't stop bleeding, you can come on down to the happiest place on earth, aka the ER, and we can either staple, sew, or glue that head shut. See you in a few. Tips from the ER. Smelly vajayjays. It's one of the most common problems people come into the ER for. Smelly by April fools, motherfuckers. It's the 1st of April, so let the lies and deceit begin. If you plan on pranking somebody, your friend, wife, or total stranger, let's make sure you don't cause them enough physical harm to end up in the ER. Give them a healthy dose of emotional harm, and then reassure them that you're still pals by gifting them a motherfucker hoodie. There's really no significant difference in the ER on April Fool's Day. It's business as usual. Grandmas and grandpas are falling down, you're wondering if that chest pain is a heart attack, and you don't know why your tummy hurts. We're offering discounts on treatments all day. You'll get a free x-ray of any part of your body with every ER visit. Just let them know Stevie O sent you. Tips from the ER. Spontaneous pneumothorax. It's when, for no obvious reasons, extra unwanted air leaks into the space between your chest and your lungs. The air pushes against your lungs, causing them to collapse, making you unable to breathe. You could have been driving your car, walking your dog, or doing your best LeBron James impression, running after that chase down block. Not in my house! <clears throat> One thing is for certain, a spontaneous collapsed lung happens way more often in tall, skinny males. Sorry, gentlemen, your genetics did you no favors by giving you a small chest, tiny ribcage, and nowhere for your lungs to go. 
Next time they ask you why you keep skipping leg day, tell them you're trying to get your chest bigger to prevent a pneumothorax. I'm just kidding, motherfuckers. It does not work like that. If you come into the ER, we cut a hole between your ribs, stretch it out wide enough to stick a tube into your chest, stick that tube into a sucking machine that will suck all that extra unwanted air out your chest, giving your lungs so much more space for activities. Tips from the ER. Easter. Church bells, family gatherings, and Easter egg hunts. Make sure your grandmas are sufficiently hydrated before service and that your aunties are properly vaccinated before going in for a smooch. It's your baby's first Easter egg hunt and you did everything you could to keep them safe, but accidents happen, motherfuckers. Your little Tommy frolicking in the garden sees his first Easter egg that you, his loving mother, hid strategically in front of the bush because you have absolutely zero faith in little Tommy's search and rescue skills. He screams in jubilation, runs towards the egg, and as he's one step away, he trips. <gasps> Was it a garden hose, a tree branch, an anaconda? It doesn't matter because he split his face open. And now you're at the ER trying to convince the triage nurse that you are a good parent. You never meant for this to happen, but they couldn't care less about your sorry excuses. They're just happy to let you know that the ERs aren't as busy on holidays like Easter and that you'll be home in time to feed little Tommy that six course meal that you spent all morning preparing, giving him a tummy ache, sending him right back here to us. It's gonna be a rough morning for little Tommy. Tips from the ER, alert and oriented. When you come into the ERs, it's pretty standard to do a basic neurological exam. We have to know if you're alert and oriented to your reality, motherfuckers. We do this by asking four simple questions. Number one, do you know who you are? What is your name? If you hesitate, we're gonna have a problem. Number two, do you know where you are? Look around you, use your clues. The stethoscopes and scrubs should give it away. Number three, what is today's date? Go, three, two, one, and. Eh. That question is a lot harder than it seems. We will settle for the correct year, 2020. And finally, number four, do you know why you're here? What happened? Some providers like to get cute and ask you who the president is. A touchy subject for some of you. If you get all four questions correctly, you are considered A and O times four. Your brain is totally working. We use your answers to gauge how you're doing throughout the day. And if anything changes, we'll know something's wrong. Tips from the ER, kidney stones. If you've ever felt the pain from a kidney stone, God bless you. Those things can hurt more than getting kicked in the nuts with a steel-toed boot. A kidney stone is basically a sharp rock trying to push its way through a tiny tube in your body. Think of it like a Rubik's Cube trying to push its way through a garden hose. The stone forms when your urine is too thick with crap. One way to prevent this is to dilute your urine by drinking more water. It's always good to hydrate, motherfuckers. If you come into the ER, the first thing we have to do is scan around your kidneys to make sure it's a stone. If it's small enough and you're still functioning properly, we send you home with a strainer and wait for you to pee it out. Make sure to catch it and send it back to us. We want to see it. If it's too big or the pain is unbearable, you got options, motherfuckers. Number one, pulverize it from the outside using a strong sound wave to break up the stone. Two, stick a small telescope up your urethra to scoop it out. Or three, cut you open and surgically remove it. Tips from the ER. Bloody taste. We've all been there as a child. You cut your hand or your finger open doing God knows what. You start to bleed and your first instinct is to put it in your mouth and suck it. Some of you still have this dirty habit, but we won't judge. If you've ever tasted blood, either your own, someone else's, or a wild animal's, you'll notice that it has a weird taste to it. Kind of like licking a metal pole. But why does your blood taste like metal? I'll tell you why, motherfuckers. It's because it contains lots of iron. Not enough to make you a Marvel superhero, but you're definitely closer to being Tony Stark than any other Avenger. He's the best one anyways. The iron in your blood helps move oxygen throughout your body, so that when you breathe in all that delicious O2, it's not just stuck in your lungs. Think of your iron as like the Uber drivers, and the oxygens are the passengers, waiting to get picked up to go to work.